So he was like, you know, it's going to be this boy band thing. Uh, have you heard of Take That? I said, yeah, of course I have. He goes, yeah, that's what we're going to do. I said, okay, but why are you asking me? I've been in rooms at the, the top of the top, which albums are prayed over demonically. Music is prayed over demonically. And um, that goes out to the world, goes out to the radio stations, goes out to the public. The, the journey is so beautiful when you become born again. It really is the realization that there's something in life. And, I, and recently I've been, I've been kind of tippy-toeing around my journey. So I'm I like, you know, 23 years with God. How much of that have I utilized? How much of that have I give to God? Actually give my time to God to know, to understand and build my relationship. And you know what I'm gonna say? I'm ashamed of myself because I haven't given enough. Shane, thanks so much for joining us on the program. My today. pleasure indeed. Obviously, you're really famous for having been in, you know, Thank you. Boy Zone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to talk about that obviously later in the interview, but let's start at the beginning, back in, you know, your your little town in yeah, Dub Dublin. Dublin, where you were from, um, and life in the Lynch family. Can you tell us a bit about that and what it was like growing up? You know, was faith part of your life? Give us a bit of an insight into that world. 1976, there was a boy born in Dublin town called Shane Lynch. So it happens to be me. And I was born into a family. Um, I've got five sisters and I'm the only boy. And we were, a, uh, were we a faith-based family? Definitely born into, uh, as a Catholic family. My dad was, he's a very, I wouldn't say staunch Catholic, but he ten, attended church pretty much every Sunday. Now, he would leave when church started, as in from the house, whatever time, 11 o'clock, he would leave the house to make sure he got there for the last 10 minutes. So he, he didn't get there for the whole anything other than, he always said he went to pay his respects to God for his healthy children and stuff like that. So he didn't necessarily go to be that staunch Catholic. He just paid respects to God. That's interesting. So, so you grew up with a sense that there was a God, um, that he was someone to revere and honor, but you didn't necessarily have a personal relationship with him at that stage. Yeah, I would say he didn't have a, a personal relationship and probably still doesn't today. He has the heart uh, of God, without a doubt. He's a very generous man, very kind man, very generous man, but never quite crossed over into actually knowing Christ. Let's talk a bit about your school years because you, you, were dysle you are dyslexic yeah. um, and, and that meant that your school years were particularly difficult. And I've heard you talk about this in the past. You almost talk about it like it was a trauma. It was a traumatic experience. Um, can you tell me a bit about how that, that diagnosis has affected your life, particularly at school? I think I got diagnosed many years later. Uh, I did a program for Channel 5, maybe about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more. And it was about dyslexia. And the whole thing of that program was me going into prisons um, and meeting inmates in there talking about their dyslexic problems, why they're in there for not being able to, as simple as not being able to fill out a job sheet. So they went to the crime, simple as stuff like that. And then into millionaires, self-made millionaires who are dyslexic and the way they visualize and can break down scenarios that uh, a lot of other brains can't. We have a very dynamic brain as a dyslexic um, that allows us to see um, the whole cube in front of us and not just one dimension. We see uh, many routes to many different ways that things can be solved. And me as a young kid, I did recognize that, but my main thing was I wasn't the same as the other kids because I could not do what they could do. I couldn't read what they could read and I couldn't participate in the classroom the way they participated. So that put me into an interesting point of survival mechanisms in life, I think. And I became a great sportsman because that was my avenue to achievement. I couldn't academically achieve, so how else am I gonna do this? So I, I, yeah, I, was, I, I ended up being a very good sportsman and, and I got through schooling that way, my, my junior school. Secondary school, a little different. Secondary school was a bit more survival tactics. I would have been 12, 13, 14 years old. Uh, starting to understand the world a little better and ultimately speaking um, to duck and to dive and to weave a little better and to cheat the system. 
let's call that straight up cheat the system, cheat exams, cheat everything just to get by and to get into uh, not being flagged up that I have a problem. That would have been, I suppose, at that point. Um, not a disruptive child. I wasn't uh, the clown of the class. I was more, I hid behind the person in front of me. So it sounds like in your school years, you, you found means and techniques to um, avoid detection as being somebody different, which a lot of young people would do anyway, you know, because being different is something that a lot of people don't want to be when you're yeah. a teenager. But it sounds like you've now, you know, in adult life, come to see dyslexia and, and neurodiversity as a positive. Would that be a fair assessment? 100%. love that word. Neurodiversity, did you say? So neurodiversity, is, yeah. Uh, diversity. Um, that it, covers autism. It yes, covers yes, yes. Dyslexia. No, you're 100% right. And it takes a lot to recognize that within yourself. But when you realize you have a skill set uh, beyond the classroom, um, then it's quite a magical thing. But to find that in yourself and to, to find that that's a goodness and not a hindrance um, is a brain change. You know, it, it, I, I did speak to neurologists also on that documentary I did, and they were just explaining the brain, which is a lovely thing too, for someone to kind of uh, give you the idea of why you couldn't to possibly how you can. And he was saying that the parts of the brain that fuse together as a young baby uh, in a dyslexic brain, that doesn't happen. It does eventually continue to fuse. So my uh, capabilities of reading and writing now are far greater than they ever have been. Um, and I continue to, to practice and continue to try. And, and it starts to become more recognizable. I'll give you like a, an example. Uh, if you're in situ of a restaurant and I know I'm in a restaurant, so therefore certain words will look a particular way and uh, th uh, that'll be okay for me. But take me out of that restaurant, give me the same piece of paper with those, the same menu as such in, in sentences, I, I can't quite recognize them. So it's, it's, a it's just developing your surroundings. Where am I? And then what are those words that you can piece together being in a church? What, what kind of words can I see in a church? Altar, tabernacle, this. So once you understand that in your brain, you can start to then recognize in places what will say, what should be said, kind of. That's absolutely fascinating. And do you think that, um, do you think that is also to do with the autism or do you think that that's just the dyslexia? Have you, have you managed to figure out how the two interact as yet? No, I really haven't. Um, I think autism and dyslexia and all the, the, the spectrums, you know, the bar, uh, and, and I think that's the, the, the place we're in now. It's fantastic where we are now and learning uh, through the system um, that, you know, there isn't a bar. Just because you're over the bar doesn't mean you are, and you're under the bar means you aren't. We, we're all very dynamic in many ways, and it's just to how you process it and deal with it and how you actually put it into life and your life in, in, in the given moment, I think. Well, I mean, let's talk about your life then, because, you know, it's really interesting the, the, the trajectory that your life has gone on, because you, you, at one point, at one stage, you were looking like you were gonna follow in your dad's footsteps, you know, become a car mechanic, that would be your career. Um, you know, he had a very successful business and you love cars, you still love cars. Yeah, I do. So I'm fascinated to ask you how you went from that pathway to going somewhere completely different and ending up in a world famous boy band. The interesting journey and in all of that is, everything you said is correct. I, I left school um, about the age of 15 um, and the truth of that is I was kindly asked not to come back to school. So I wasn't, quick, I wasn't kicked out, right? I was kindly asked not to come back. And uh, the principal did say, look, Mr. Lynch, somebody else deserves this place. How about you just don't come back? I said, that's, that's a fair point. Like I wasn't uh, angry at that. It was just, okay, what is my next survival tactic in life? My dad's business. I'd already worked for him uh, most evenings after school anyway. I was a petrol pump attendant and a tire fitter uh, in his garage. But the next step was to become that apprentice car mechanic. So that's his main workshop. And realistically, uh, one boy out of all the girls, um, all the girls also, my two older sisters, uh, and I went before me also were petrol pump attendants and tire fitters and all my younger sisters too, the bewitched girls and all that kind of stuff. They, they all had the same journey as, as, a, as family members in family business. It's just the obvious one for me as a boy was to be the car mechanic and move into that. Um, and I did, and I loved it. I, I loved being a car mechanic because of the, the physicalities of it all. 
Um, wasn't much practical work about it. It was hands-on and I knew how to swing a spanner, if you want to say, I wasn't that bad. Um, and then by the age of 17, uh, a guy knocked on my door, which I, I hadn't seen for uh, quite a, a couple of years because of that schooling system that I left. Um, and I, he was in the same class as me. And he said, look, do you, would you like to be in a band? I never considered that one bit in life ever. The music interests I had at the time were more American based, a bit more urban based and not necessarily Irish, U2, Cranberry, Sinead O'Connor, the typical rock renowned Ireland. I was a little, again, left, left field of Ireland and straight over to America, US, USA influenced. So he, I, obviously, when I say I've got five sisters, they know what a boy band is. So he was like, you know, it's going to be this boy band thing. Uh, have you heard to take that? I said, yeah, of course I have. He goes, yeah, that's what we're going to do. I said, okay, but why are you asking me? And he was like, oh, because you, you, like, you have the right look. I said, what does that mean? Uh, he goes, no, like, you know, remember back in the day and uh, all the girls were into you and all the girls were into me. This is kind of how he approached it. And I was like, yeah, but that's not a thing. You're going to start something because of that, can you? And he goes, no, no, we're going to do this. So fast forward and getting the name of Louis Walsh and getting a meeting with Louis Walsh and saying, yeah, we got this idea. And Louis was like, I love it, lads. And within a week, we were on the, the radio talking about the process of Boyzone, the auditions, the, the gathering of the band or the clan as such. And, um, and that started to happen. And it was such a bizarre time. Uh, for me, it's, so blessed because I, I'm, I'm not into singing, dancing, playing guitars. I'm not into, I wasn't into music. It's like a direction that came only out of what was meant to be. So I, I think in all of the journey I've gone on in, in the boy's own journey, I have to just give that to God. Not that I knew it at the time, not that I knew that at the beginning of it. For me, I was just a chancer. And this was an opportunity to do something that I've never done. Uh, which was very strange also because I was quite a shy individual. Didn't have that talent prospect and I didn't rehearse in that remit. I was just a car mechanic. So I entered a domain of, okay, I'll give it a go. Pure chance. So was there anything about the fame element that attracted you? You know, were you kind of envisaging yourself making lots of money or being on a stage? Or was there anything about that that, that drew you in? I don't need the fame element drew me in because I didn't necessarily want to be a star. I think a lot of people certainly go, oh, I want to be famous. No, I was the guy who hid behind everyone for all my life. So to now stand uh, in front of everybody certainly was not the, uh, the reason why. I think, I think it was a, just a blind side of, oh, I'll give it a go. Not, not really understanding anything that it was going to become, but just going on a journey. And it really quickly happened. It really, well, what seems really quickly, I suppose, to the world, although we traveled down in the back of a, a transit van for a good year, up and down through Ireland, playing to scout dens and little uh, school halls and that kind of stuff. It was, a, uh, it was a, a, a foundation growing scenario. We didn't have the social medias, of course, so we had to go town to town, door to door. Um, I'd love to say city to city, but I think there's only a couple in Ireland. Um, <laughs> by a stretch of imagination, but um, uh, we, built, we built from the ground up and that was hard work. That was hours and hours and hours of travel. And we thought, well, we thought that was hard work. And then we found the UK, which absolutely blew our minds. And then we found the world. <laughs> and of course, Boyzone then did go on to do massive things, didn't it? You, mm -hmm. know, you sold millions of records. You've had hit six, six number one, I think, singles. Um, you know, it was, it was known by everybody. Um, what were some of the highs of that experience? What, what were the things that you look, look back on and you think that was absolutely incredible? What are, what are the standout moments? The journey itself was incredible and still continues to be, if I'm honest. We, I'm 30 years in the music industry, let's say, and it's never left me to the point of where I still walk down the street. You can't just turn the tap off and go, okay, I'm, I'm out. I'm not doing this stuff anymore. People, it's their life, their lives as well, who grew up with you. So there's a, there's a certain amount of inheritance that you just have that will stay with you for life. And 
looking back at some of the places, um, we at the moment, me and the boys, were, were together a little bit talking about the journey of Boys Own. We're making a, a documentary at the minute um, from the beginning to the end. And it's fascinating to me. It's, it is, I, I look at it quite biblical in a Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke and John scenario. Um, it's, we, we tell the story four different ways of what's happened in the Boys Own journey. And I love that because they remember it so different, I remember it so different, but it's the same story. And I'm fascinated listening to them even from what we achieved and what we did. Because of some of it I genuinely don't remember. I don't remember being there. Um, and some of it's such a, uh, a regression. And I'm like, oh my gosh, do you remember that? Like Michael Jackson sitting in the front row of a Boys Own concert. And the reason why he came in Dublin is because he bought the rights to uh, the Bee Gees music. And we had done a, a cover version of the Bee Gees. And he came to see who was singing their song and who was making them all the royalties. And singing the song with the Bee Gees on TV, singing with Pavarotti, um, you know, just the, the, the greats of the world uh, of music that we know. And I shared time with them. I, sh I shared the stage with them. And then the people themselves, you know, the, the supporters of the band, the 90s was such a beautiful time in music, such an innocence, such an, a great uh, culture to the point of where kids had something to be a part of, to tune into. And it wasn't sexualized the way the music in the industry is today. It was, it was, it was lovely. Um, from the Spice Girls to Boys Own to Take That to Westlife to all of those scenarios was a gorgeous time in music. And the world travel is mind blowing looking back on it. Um, I, th I think the, the, from the Middle East to the Far East to Australia to everything that we covered um, by foot, let's call it, you know, because we had to do the do, we had to do the rounds, we had to go to the towns and that was globally and globally we, we, we uh, spread our wings for, I don't know, seven years or so, whatever it was, 93 to 2000-ish there. So was it, was it those moments standing on the stage looking out, seeing people like Michael Jackson in the front row, like you said, and having that kind of, I mean, I can't imagine it, you know, I've never done it, never stood on a stage in front of thousands of people. I mean, I can imagine that would be a very big high, a big kind of adrenaline rush. Was it those moments that, that you liked or, um, or, or was it the, the international, the, the opportunities that you got because of where you got to go and the people that you got to meet? What was the stuff that really got you going and got you excited about that, doing that job? Interesting question to the point of none of the above and all of the above. Which is, and, and, and what I mean by that is, um, it was, you were just on the train. The train was going, so you were just on it. It's whatever cab you went in to at the point of the big long train was kind of the same thing. The, because it was stage after stage, TV show after TV show, interview after interview. And it's not like you particularly looked forward to anything, it's because it was just the same. And that was the world you live in, that was your job. Yes, standing on stage uh, was fantastic. And, but at some point, which is an interesting point, in the late 90s, it was also a very lonely place. Although there's 20,000 people plus, and you're on that stage and they're there to see you, that's it's still a very lonely place to be. Surrounded by my, my brothers, for sure, the boys. But at the same time, traveling with them for X amount of years is, is tiring and you know how to push each other's, other's buttons and you, you know um, that I think realistically what we needed in, in amongst that time that would have been fantastic was a break. And what does that mean? Uh, just time to, to know who you are again. It was such a go, go, go because the record we had done uh, in 1995 um, had to travel for a whole year on that same record where we're already making a new one and starting uh, in 1996 um, and it, the continuation of the process was just monotonous but fabulous and I wish we had a bit more time as a young man to appreciate that without a doubt. A young man was, I was just on a journey. Um, what was good about it? Oh, I don't know. It was magical in many ways but it was, I wish I, wish I was a bit more mature perhaps. I mean, I've heard you talk about the, the harder parts of, uh, you know, in the past and in other interviews, you talked about the harder parts of that time in Boyzone, and it would be good to, to explore some of that with you today. 
Um, you know, you, you did start drinking, didn't you? And you kind of got into a bit of a spot of bother and swearing on camera and <laughs> fights with Puff Daddy and all sorts. Yeah, it was all sorts. <laughs> Shenanigans, we call it. <laughs> That's the word for it. Um, what do you think, was it that sense of monotony that was lead it, that led you towards that just kind of destructive behaviour or was it something else? The industry is destructive. So let me take it straight to God um, and straight to, straight, straight to the world as a spiritual world. We have the Holy Spirit that guides us and protects us in the name of Christ. But the spirits, multiple and plural, that the demonic side of the music industry is very real too. That's how I came to God, through understanding the demonic side. So I think the industry has um, a way of just taking control of you in many self-destruct uh, scenarios. I was certainly interested in being mysterious. It gave me a character, it gave me some substance that I could hold on to. And why I did that or why I, I portrayed myself in, in those ways, uh, I don't know. Maybe I was trying to prove something out of a boy band scenario, perhaps. But also, it intrigued me, the world, the darker side of the world, the Ouija boards, uh, Ouija boards, uh, seances, all that kind of spiritual tar tarot card reading, all that kind of stuff really got a hold of me. And interestingly, that all came from our very first album launch, which you would say, which you would look at very innocently because it was around Halloween. It was a Halloween party in a big mansion. But in that was super demonic, super demonic. But for what, this young kids, it's a, bit of, it's a bit of fun. All the record company are there and all the, the journalists are there. And here we go. Well, when I look at the, the way the industry um, has the ruling over music. Now, of course, not all music is bad. By all means, it's not but majority of it there is to take you away from Christ. 100% take you away from Christ. In terms of the lyrics, and the, is that what you mean? Or do you mean the industry itself, people, the big players in the industry? Both lyrically and both big players. Both, um, I've been in rooms at the, the top of the top, which albums are prayed over demonically. Music is prayed over demonically. Um, that goes out to the world, goes out to the radio stations, goes out to the public. And when you see that stuff and know that stuff, it's frightening. What do you mean by that, Shane, prayed over demonically? So uh, rituals, ceremonies, everything to bring, um, uh, to give light to, to, to the devil, to Satan. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a satanic music industry. That's majority of what it is. Do you, do you mean figuratively or do you mean literally you've been in... Literally, yes. And can, Not you, figuratively. can you share what those albums were? Um, were they your albums? No, they weren't they... our albums, no. They were not boys' own albums. Um, so that's what I mean by not every music is that, but it was on the stepping stone to that. So you're going back to the 1993s into 2000s. And then um, if you look at what the music is today, the industry is today, uh, for all your Sam Smiths, to your Dojo Cats, to your Beyonce's, to they are so demonic, it's unbelievable. And we can't, it's in front of us. And um, it's something that we uh, kind of go, oh, it's just music. But it really isn't. It's absolutely taken over the world, taken over our children, and taken over uh, everything that's, that, that's coming to the, the times of, of world crisis. And are you talking about the, the messages that are in those, some of those songs, some of those, that, that some of those artists, you know, share with their fans? Yeah, messages and the glorification of Satan. And it, and it certainly had some kind of influence on you because as you said that you, you started to get very drawn into the dark side and you were interested in witchcraft and Ouija boards and, and that led to some very dark experiences for you personally. Uh -huh. um, can you tell us a bit about what those were and how those came about? It came about just through opening those doors. You know, we've got to be very careful on what doors we knock on. And as soon as you start innocently doing a tarot reading or a Ouija board or a seance or whatever them fun things as kids that we mess around with, you're given grounds to the dark side. Of course you are. You're now engaged. You've opened the door. And once you open doors, they have the rights. They have the rights to 
to come in. Um, and I opened many doors and found myself in a very, very angry, very dark place, uh, self-destruct place, uh, violent place. And at one point of all of that, um, yeah, was, was I, I don't think I was quite suicidal, but in the industry that I was in, um, the press itself was, you know, quite, uh, with the whole, I'll say, phone hacking side of things and everything that went on and the paranoia. And, you know, a lot of us celebrities are and have been true cases of all of that, which um, led to a lot of destruction. So the, the press themselves are even on a destructive path. Um, and with that, yeah, just for me came a very, very, very dark, dark place. I mean, your autobiography talks about, you know, all kinds of things, being locked into your body, having demons come and breathe in your ear, uh -huh. levitating beds. I mean, it's pretty out there. And you, but you were exp experienced that. So when people kind of say to you, surely not, like that's, that's nonsense, or, you know, maybe that's in your mind, or maybe that, you know, what, what do you say to them? I say the devil's doing a great job of diverting your truths. And Hollywood's, Hollywood is doing a great job of it too, because it's, it, that's what it's there to do, is to make you think it's all nonsense, of course. And if you think it's all nonsense, then the devil's laughing, and it's very real. And, you know, if, if you're a Christian and you understand the Bible, the Bible talks about demons. That means it's real. If you understand the Bible is real, you know, all of that's not in there for no reason. So just because you've never seen it, and I wish you never do, um, if you've never been a part of it, but you still have to understand it's biblical. And luckily for me, it was biblical. And luckily for me, it's how I found God because I knew the dark so well. I knew they were real. I hung out with them, which means, well, if you're real, surely God is real. And that's kind of my flip journey of how I had to, had to get out of where I was. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, so how did you go from being involved in the dark side, seeing all kinds of you know, horrible things to, to becoming a Christian? What, what did that path look like? The path looked like that to a friend. And that friend, was his name is Ben Ofeidu. I knew him since the mid 90s. He was in multiple different bands at the time. Um, super good friend of mine uh, in life. But he had a particular way that he behaved and spoke. And eventually in about 2002-ish, I got in a band with him or a music project with him, let's call it. So I started to do, uh, cause I was into my hip hop, into my USA influence side of things. We started to do um, a little project together called Red Hill. And Red Hill was just hip hop, the stuff that we loved and stuff that we listened to. And hanging around with him and his couple of friends, they, they were Christians too. Um, they, he was, had a great way of just the knowledge, his knowledge of the Bible was incredible and the stories of the Bible. And he just broke down parables for me and broke down scenarios in my life. And the more I listened to him is the more I loved and the more I loved is the more I, I, I fed off. The more I fed off is the more hungry I was. And I, it, I just found myself being drawn to, let's call it the light, the blatantly to Christ. I found myself being drawn to Christ through this guy. And the more I got into it is the more I started to make my changes. And I, I, I went back to church, a, a Catholic church, and I just sat in the back by myself. And what fascinated me about that time is uh, it wasn't empty, it was full. It was, a, it was full of families. And I sat, I didn't really listen to this, uh, the priest at the time, I just looked, I, I spent the hour looking at people and looking at families and looking at why they were here and what they were getting from it. And that's what intrigued me was people. And then the more I kind of went to churches, the more I heard and the more obviously I got connected to. And then I, I met my wife, um, early 03, I met my wife and she comes from a long line of, so her dad was a bishop, uh, her brother's a pastor and in a church in London uh, called the Tabs, Pastor Michael White. And I, I started to go to a Bible study on a Wednesday. I didn't quite get to the Sunday yet. I have, wasn't brave enough to enter the, the Sunday realm of church. So I was just interested. So I started to go to a Bible study on a Wednesday and my mind was blown. 
absolutely blown what I was receiving, what I was, what I was hearing, what I was getting from the Word it was so incredible. But at that time, I will say the demonic attacks at that time were massive also. Can you give us some examples of what happened? The pull between the two got real, really real. And the visitations got more and the, the timing in visitations. And, and I, I know that's quite dark for a lot of people. And uh, what do you mean a visitation? I mean spirits visually in my room and the torment and the torture, the mental, the, the, the annoyance that if you want to call it the chattering of the teeth as they talk in hell, it was very real and it became so uh, like a, this spiritual battle for me. But luckily I, I, I knew what was right. And luckily I, I knew I had a stronger way in Christ. Although I wasn't born again yet or nothing like that. I just knew um, that I needed to go that way. And even up till the day I got baptized, um, which is coming up soon actually, uh, the, the 13th of November, uh, 03, that's when I was baptized. Up until that given day, everything went wrong on that day to try and get to church to be baptized, everything. And you know, it's, it's like this interview. Uh, and, I, and I love how real God is. And I love how real things are put in your way when, you're not, when, when, when the enemy tries to take you from something great. I mean, t it, today was such a battle to get here um, for no reason at all. Like, what, what was the purpose of that? just not so I don't, I don't get here. And you guys maybe had to go home early and I couldn't talk about this stuff and all of that. It, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how obvious it is. Um, but it's amazing how it's not even a battle when you know Christ because there is no battle. Christ is the almighty and the devil just cannot win. And that is the point. Uh, but until you know that, it seems like a battle. You talk, Shane, about the, you, you, the fact that you weren't born again at that, at that point. So did there... Did there become a point for you where you gave your life to Christ and things changed? I'm gonna say it's not that things change, it's, it's you have to change. So when I got baptized and I came out of the water, and I think, I think that's the confusion for a lot of people. They think there's a switch, right? It's switch, I'm different. No, this is your beginning, this is your journey, this is your birth, this is, now you're gonna make the, the steps to be right, to be better, to be more Christ-like. You're still you, of course you are. But now what you have inside you and the ability to change is very different. You have Christ on your side. The Holy Spirit is on your side. So you just have to start tuning into what that is. And start listening to, we all make those decisions, you know, um, and it was, uh, it, it's just, where do you go from here? You can't just kick the wall over and you're different. You gotta take it down brick by brick. It's important that you take it down brick by brick because I know when you have the zeal of God and when you're fed by God, um, you, want to, you, you want to street preach. Of course you do. Like, I love street preachers because I know where they're at in, in, their, in their heart. Their heart is so for, for Christ and they cannot believe that you lot don't know about it. You lot walking around, do not know Christ. And they're screaming and shouting at them. And it's the most beautiful thing. And you want to do it, but you just got to be try and maintain control somehow. But that does, that does work for some people. They're not doing anything wrong. But it also, I think for me, it was just a, not that I tippy toed into it. Actually, I became quite um, announced on the word of Christ. I don't think I shy away from that. Um, I speak quite openly about my God is my God and I love my Jesus in the circular world of music and have done since 03, 04, 05 onwards and all TV shows and music scenarios. Um, but the, the journey is so beautiful when you become born again. It really is the realization that there's something in life. And, I, and recently I've been, I've been kind of tippy-toeing around my journey. So I'm I like, you know, 23 years with God. How much of that have I utilized? How much of that have I give to God, actually give my time to God to know, to understand and build my relationship? And you know what I'm gonna say? I'm ashamed of myself because I haven't given enough. And that's my fault. And that's absolutely my fault. I know Christ and I have authority to know him more and I don't do enough about it. I've changed that now in the last year or so, but that 20 year period, oh, I'm born again, isn't it? This is great. And I still got 10 church and stuff, but I did not practice enough. I did not bring in the word of God enough. Um, and that comes down to 
my recent times and why I'm here in this interview is, is, is Premier Christian Radio has changed my life, you know, in the last two years. Absolutely changed my life, which is incredible because what it's given me from what I hadn't had from my five hour journeys in cars, I'm, I'm fed so much from you guys, Premier Christian Radio in Christ, that I've missed out so much of those years on a simple little thing. So you, are you saying that if you had been listening to Premier Christian Radio and kind of doing that for, for uh, you know, previously, you felt that you would have maybe, um, your discipleship journey would, have be, would look different? Absolutely, far different, because I'm with Christ a lot of the time in my days now, not just, uh, like, even my gym, I've got a gym at home, so I work out at home, and, and I now watch either TBN, I watch the God Channel, I watch, so I work, my whole building of the body and mind uh, is in my gym, is in my car, and is, is with my God. When again you realize that, and you, it, it's available to you, it changes your whole concept of what Christ is again. Um, and it's my Sunday delivery of service, which I love, I now go to an audacious church uh, up in Manchester. Um, Pastor Glenn and Sophie are fabulous. Uh, I've been under their kind of roof maybe four years now because I moved from Surrey uh, up to Cheshire. And, um, and I, I love what I get fed from Sunday, but it's not enough. It's never enough. It used to be enough, I thought, but it can't be enough. You have to fellowship as much as you possibly can. And how do you do that other than re uh, reading your Bible or watching these programs on TV or listening to the radio? And it's just given me so much more insight to how the world should be, how I should be in the world and how recognizable um, that should be in us. And do you feel, do you get opportunities now um, or, or even you know, in your history, have you had opportunities to share the gospel with others who are in the music industry? Can you tell us any of those stories? I've never been the outgoing preacher. Um, sharing your love of God in the industry is not doing what they're doing most of the time. <laughs> it's been in the same room some of the times but not doing what they're involved in. What is that? Just particular behavior, for instance. Certain conversations that might be had that you don't interject into, you stay well out of. It shows certain presence and it shows interest without having to say anything. A lot less said in a circumstance is a lot more noticeable. During that time that you, you were in Boys and you, you were having those experiences, um, you had a lot of tattoos done, didn't yeah. you, that were kind of almost a little bit blasphemous. Uh -huh. um, did you have to, what did you do about that once you became a Christian? Did you have them lasered? Did you, did no. you leave them? Did you add stuff over the top? Yeah, I've, I've got did tattoos that, on tattoos now, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, back in the day, I, I remember being in Hong Kong um, and I have a, a massive crucifix uh, over uh, my, my heart, which is broken because I was anti-God, anti-Christ I was. And one that it's in that Hong Kong experience was one of the worst experiences I had on visitations. Funny enough, uh, but uh, in in later years I got a, I got some beads wrapped around that to kind of connect it again and just make it, it's making your way through that journey. Should Christians be tattooed? Absolutely not. Look at me though, I'm a Christian, right? Um, I wouldn't recommend you go get tattooed um, by all means, but I think visually, I'm also. Uh, I'm connecting to the world that is, I am one of God's tools that I look like this and I look like many other people who look like this and now we've got something in common. And, and I think God just has to use people who look like other people who will get it. So I don't recommend it, but I look like this for a reason. When you became a Christian, Shane, did you, what did your family think of that? Because obviously they're Catholics, um, or at least your dad is and you were following, you were now kind of effectively Protestant or certainly not Catholic. Yeah, no. <laughs> Did they have any issues with that? No, they didn't have any issues with that because as they say, their son came home. So that meaning by that is I was so reckless and so gone and I, I was so le uh, left of who they knew their son was. I was now, all right, I was now you could talk to me. I was now, a bit civilized, a little bit more controlled, a little bit more disciplined, a little bit more everything 
that, that, that was reckless about me has, you know, tapered off and I came back. Um, not that I am the prodigal son by all means, but uh, at somewhat, that's how they saw it. Um, do they, what did I think about Christianity now? I think the positive side of all of that is they listen, they hear what I have to say, they realize what I'm saying is the words of Christ, the light of God. So you, you can't not go, huh? Oh, because God's, you know, the, God's word is incredible. So when you speak it in any way you speak it, you don't have to preach it, people. But when you just act it, speak it, do it, live it, then it's recognizable. And then they go, like, oh, no, it's, it's, no, he's doing all right, the kid. You know? So whether they'd ever cross over themselves and become a born again Christian, which of course I'd love, um, but we'll still t uh, knock away at that uh, hardened stone or so, you know, we'll chip away, so we will. When you became a Christian, did you find that the demonic um, stuff stopped overnight? No, uh, it still hasn't stopped. You know, the, the, there's still a battle out there. I still live on the, in the world. I'm still on this earth. And on this earth is a lot of demonic scenarios, a lot of evil, a lot of, of that. I just have to stay in Christ. And the more I stay in Christ is the more I can um, be stronger against the, the principalities and, and the forces that, that are against us. You know, you talked a bit about some of the ways that you feel that the devil kind of interacts with your life and, and now. It, does that look different? Because I, so, I think lots of people think you're involved in something, you have some dark stuff like visitations, demonic th uh, things. Um, you then become a Christian, you get delivered from that and then you move forward. But I, I have actually spoken to quite a few people who have been baptised, become Christians and actually needed deliverance ministry in order to move them forward. Was that something that was the case for you? No, there's, everyone's journey is super different than Christ, without a doubt. And I think, I, I, wasn't, I wouldn't be say I was uh, delivered in terms of a possession scenario as such, but my deliverance was being filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking with tongues, you know, going into to, um, to find that. And that is my strength and, and I think, as I continue uh, in the Word, continue with Christ, I just recognize um, the dark side of, of everything. And it's the recognition that I can see that I can maneuver through mm -hmm. as a, more than a deliverance from, and now I'm free to go. Because no, you, it will, there will always be a battle. Christ himself, you know, was, was uh, brought to the point of where uh, he had to make a choice and so if the devil can come and chat to Christ, he's definitely going to come and chat to us. We're not, we're not delivered from that at all. And so it sounds like you found the gift of tongues to be helpful in that, in that sort of journey. Yeah. Um, no, just being known that that's how I've come to those really close points, of point, uh, uh, that my relationship with God is that fulfilled. My relationship with God is um, receiving the gift of tongues, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, receiving my connections, direct line to God. You said at the beginning of this interview, you talked a lot about survival tactics. Uh -huh. I think that's the word you used. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Survi yeah, survival tactics as, as the way that you operate in the world. Do you f still feel like you're surviving, trying to survive different situations? Or do you, do you feel like you have a, a peace, like more peace in life? There's more peace in the trust of God. And I have certainly given, a lo uh, given up a lot of my, what I would worry about from my, uh, give us a day, our daily bread, you know? And I, and I think money's making money. Uh, businesses and sometimes when I look at some businesses not doing well I don't look to Christ I just trust in Christ and I'm in a multiple of businesses some haven't quite made it and some are doing very well and I've been like that for many many years however I'm definitely if it's if God takes it away from me takes it down from me or stops something it means he has something better for me and that's fine in my life no matter what I thought but I thought this was the one. I thought this was the business. I thought this was great. God does not necessarily do that. He might give you something sometimes because you're really passionate about it. But if it's not meant to be successful, it's not going to be. Mm -hmm. And he will point you in the right direction all the time. And that's what being in, uh, in touch with your Holy Spirit is, is listening. Like I've opened many things that I wish I had listened to my, my intuition, which is called the Holy Spirit and gone, but I really wanted to do them. So I did. And then, oh, okay, Lord. I know I did hear, but I just didn't do what you said, you know? <laughs> and I think they're the things of 
why I, I look back and think, oh my gosh, I had such a lifeline that I, I didn't keep building on. And the more we build on our lifeline in crisis, the more we hear, the more we understand, the more we just know. And it just gets more obvious. Do you have um, particular places or moments in your day where you feel like you hear God, God more? Do you have like a, a daily kind of practice or um, do you go to a specific location? How do, you, how do you find God speaking to you and how do you like to communicate with, with God? Uh, continuously, in, from step to step, from vision to vision, as in visually what I'm looking at to walk in. My whole day is about Christ. And uh, I have, I wouldn't say routines by all means, but um, if, if, I'm up, if I'm out cycling, there's a particular cliff I go to and I, and I stand and it's such a beautiful, beautiful place to, to look out uh, across at the Welsh mountains from where I live. And the slightest breeze is, I, I just feel like the, the breath of God on my face and, you know, I have a good chat with him there. Um, and my, my daily is just daily God. I, I don't have a, a non, uh, an off button, you know, it, it, my, my belly, my, my every decision making is in the mindful of Christ or I certainly try and make it that. And then when I realize I haven't made it in the mind of Christ, that means it's, it's gone wrong. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I forgot, I forgot to have a chat about that one, didn't I? You know? <laughs> You said earlier this year, Shane, that you were quitting show business for yeah. good. Um, what do you feel God is saying to you at the moment about you know your life at the moment, life going forward? What's He calling to, calling you to for the future? Do you think? I'm still struggling with that one um, because I made a massive decision that I cut show business, and for me that was all interviews, all. Um, TV shows, all music stuff. And I've made that decision a few times in life, but I keep getting put back in. And in those scenarios, I'm still trying to figure out, is this God put me back in? Am I meant to be in there? Am I still, have I not finished what he put me in there in the first place for? Am I trying to jump out too early? And he's saying, no, Shane, get back in there, mate. You're not done. I'm still trying to figure that out because in all of my decisions that I've made, um, me and the boys are spending some time together on this new documentary, like I was saying, for, uh, for Sky. So I'm back in, in all of my, I'm out. But I'm in for the journey of Boys Own. I don't want to make albums. I don't want to do TV shows, but this is a massive TV show I'm doing. And I'm still trying to figure that one out. I don't know. Um, I'm just still on the journey. <laughs> it's a hard one to answer for me. It really is. It's interesting because some of the past TV shows you've done, I've noticed that you have left before the end. Mm -hmm. Is that because you felt God speaking to you in those moments? D or did you, were you just, you'd had enough? It was like, I'm finished. No, I, that's God speaking to me in those moments, loud and clear. You're done. Well done. You've done what you needed to do. Go on home. Mm -hmm. Literally like that. Yeah. So, because I think it was Love Island and yeah, Pilgrimage like, oh, that you left before the end of the... Yeah. Yeah. Um, Love Island was, wow. That, that one was super loud and clear. That was... Uh, I was I was uh, I was um, a Christian about three years in at that point. My zeal for God was massive, and yeah, he uh, he shouted at me back then. Um, to many many of those different scenarios I was in, it was actually a, it was a beautiful time to hear God shout at you, actually, because it's loud and clear, it's non deniable. I watched the show actually, and I, what I found really interesting after your departure was the impact that you had had on the other contestants. Yeah. I was almost a bit sad that you didn't stay because I just thought, I don't think Shane realized what impact he had on these guys. Like it wasn't clear up until that point, but at the last episode, they were all talking about this inc incredible person that they met. You know, they were like, some of them were crying that you were going. <laughs> I know, bless them. <laughs> it was really quite mm. special actually. Did, did, do you look back now, do you have any regrets? No. No. No, no, I, I think the, the people who I, I, I was with, um, as you say, we as, as representations of God, is, is, we're meant to do it in our behavior, in our nature, in our conversations, and, in, and if they got everything from that, um, that's, that was my job done. I didn't need to have, have talked to them about anything and you know, follow my journey into this world of, of born again. 
they realized uh, that that's what they had been around, somebody who's Christ-like, and that was the impact. Not me, Shane Lynch, leaving, I'm just a name, but the Christ-like like impact is what they got affected by. Shane, what can the Premier family be praying for you and your, you know, Sheena, that your, your children, what can we be, be praying for for you? I guess, you know, you know I, I always find it a, a weird question when people ask me that, literally, to pray for me and a family, because I always kind of, it, it, it kind of brings me back into a very shy and protective state of, oh, I don't know, you know, what should we be praying for? What, what if I say something wrong here? You know, <laughs> no wrong answer. I know, I know, I know. But <laughs> immediately, I'm, I'm like, oh no, leave, leave, leave me alone. You know what I mean? <laughs> don't, don't ask me that. I, I don't want to ask for anything from you. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like I, I'm so full of always giving, giving, giving because that's what I've been interviewed all my life, and I'm always talking about that way. So to receive it is almost like a frightening moment, you know. But I really appreciate it, and I think just to my my family to stay strong. And in certainly my walk and my nature and my zeal to continue because I have a voice, um, as we all do for sure, but I have a platform that I can reach people and, and, and my, to feel my encouragement to continue to be able to deliver that to the masses. And not that I want to, I, I don't think being a preacher is something that I'm meant to be. I don't think that's something that I, I don't think I'm meant to be on the pulpit. Um, but I'm certainly, I have a connection to the secular world. To, 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 to pray for that encouragement, to know that, because I can be a little bit bold in, in a lot of things I say, um, bold on the Christ side of right and wrongs. Um, you know, we are at a massive separation at the moment in the world um, with all the pride stuff that's going on and all the LGBTQ stuff, uh, all of that is a massive divide of, and I think we're coming into a, for all of our Premier Christian family, I think we all need to just be mindful of the, the pull and separation of who we are as people, as Christians, because we're at some point gonna have to stand up and we're gonna be asked questions, which you, I hope we know the answer to, I'm me certainly, and and I, and I think, yeah, prayers in my strength of Christ in this separation of world. I, that was a long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that. Well, look, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today, Shane. Thank you so much no, for coming on The you. Profile.